Hi, everyone. I'm Ruth, and my story starts with chicken pies. Like this one. Yep, yeah, you know the ones. You get four in a pack for $1.99, you put them in the freezer, and then you stick them in the oven and boil up some peas for tea. My sister Amy and I grew up on these chicken pies, and we bloody loved them. <laughs> but 12 years ago, the frozen chicken pie would start a new chain of thought in me, thinking that would eventually motivate me and my sister Amy to start a radical new supermarket chain, along with the help of thousands of people who just wanted to see supermarkets change. And that's what I want to talk about to you today, because I want to explain to you how two sisters managed to challenge how supermarkets are and what it took us to do it. So, back to chicken pies. Twelve years ago, I used to uh, work in sales for a big global company, and my job was to negotiate and get our products into the big supermarkets, um, which involved a lot of meetings with the supermarket buyers. They're the people in charge of what goes on the supermarket shelves and the profit and the sales that they make from those products. So one day, I was sitting in the foyer of the supermarket head office waiting for my buyer, and he came down all excited which was unusual, because normally they have their scary, serious poker face buyer faces on, and I had to just find out, you know, what it was all about. And he said, Ruth, I've just had the most fascinating meeting about chicken pies. <laughs> well, as you can imagine, my ears pricked up, because, you know, <laughs> I, I love a chicken pie. <laughs> and he said, you never guess what, we, we've saved the supermarket millions of pounds, because, Ruth, we, we simply found out that the chicken in the chicken pies was far too good. And I'm like, oh. Well, it turns out the supplier was using a very high grade of chicken in the economy chicken pies. And the supermarket worked out that if they could persuade that supplier to downgrade to a much lower quality chicken, they could pay a lot less for the pies. Of course, they'd still sell for $1.99, and the supplier would make a lot less money and have to cut a few corners in production and in quality. But the buyer was ecstatic but he, because he knew that they, the supermarket was going to make millions more in profit. Now, I tend to get one of two reactions to chicken pie gate story. <laughs> Either you think, well, that's business. That's how it is. You know, food is um, a product like everything else. Supermarkets aren't there to do uh, what's ethically right. They're there to maximize their short-term profit. That's just how it is. Or, like me, <laughs> you get a bit angry about it. You know, it gets, gets, gets your goat. I don't know where that came from. It gets your goat. <laughs> and you think, well, no, hang on a minute. That's not how it should be. Uh, supermarkets can't just go around engineering the goodness out of food and downgrading the quality of the food we eat just to feather their own nests. Surely, surely they can strike a balance between making the profit they need and doing what's right. The question is, are they striking that balance? Well, no, they're not. I mean, I've, uh, I've done a lot of research into this over the years now, and it's very clear to me that the big supermarket business model is failing. Failing suppliers, failing customers, failing communities. They've built a business model based on the commoditization of food and the mass production of products that don't differentiate much between them. They just compete on price. It's a business model that relies on the intensification of agriculture and the industrialization of food production and that harnesses cheap global labor and cheap oil. The big supermarket bosses have made profit their goal and their god. And actually, because of that, bad food is becoming normal. And society is paying all over the place in many ways, picking up for the tab for this bad way of doing business. But there's good news. Like zillions of other things in this world, supermarkets are only how they are because people made them that way. There's no immutable law of nature or the universe that says this is how retailing must be, this is how it is in food. They're made that way because over the last 30 years, many, many people were highly motivated and worked very hard to make them that way. And the good news about that is, of course, it can be changed. And so that's what Amy, my sister, and I set out to do in August 2010. We spent three years in our little flat in Brighton, 
uh, planning to open our first supermarket store. And of course, when we sat there, we didn't have a bloody clue about how to go about starting a supermarket chain. But we did know that it started with a vision of how it should be and a set of values. And we also knew we needed a lot of help and a lot of money from people who cared. So there were three roller coaster years. Three years of business planning, brand building, cage rattling, fundraising, crowdfunding, story fitting, and crucially, building a following of loyal and eager customers who were waiting for us to open. And so, after three years, the day came, and we opened our supermarket, this is our baby, on the 7th of December 2013. Uh, this is a 3,000 square foot store in London Road, at the bottom of London Road. Uh, which is one of the cheaper high streets in town and actually is, is, now, is recovering from a period of being very run down. And the location was really important to us because, you see, what we do is it's all about making good food affordable. Good food affordable for people on everyday diets and average budgets. How do we do that? Well, we put all the good food together in one place and we erode the high margins and the high prices normally associated with good food. We make it more accessible. It's all about tipping good food and the brands that care into the mainstream market. So if you think about it, by doing this, we are challenging the big supermarket business model. Because we're not solely focused on maximizing short-term profit for our shareholders and our directors like they do. We're focused on doing something positive and ethical for the food system and for the local community. And that's why we're a social enterprise. We call our supermarket how it should be, or his be for short, because it stands up for ethical trading practices and sustaining sourceable, sustainable sourcing policy, which is what we think supermarkets in the 21st century should, should be doing. So, over the next 30 years, we intend to grow Hisby into uh, a national supermarket chain that becomes a force for change and good in food and farming. We will make the food industry fairer and more sustainable by giving people the opportunity to use their weekly sh food shopping budget for good and to change. Because change comes in two forms, doesn't it? You can either slowly steer towards change from within the current system, from how it is, or you can break with how it is and invent a completely new way. Now, I think both forms are, are really important, but I think that true empowering change only comes when you've got innovators who sit down with a blank piece of paper and start something completely new. Innovators that find a way to, to build passion from people around that and draw them to them. And these people, these innovators, there are mi millions of them out there all the time, everywhere. And I'm talking about everyday people. People like me and Amy who just got really bloody indignant about something and decided to do something about it. There are many great examples of people like this in this very city. I think Brighton's a bit of a hotbed for them. And uh, I just wanted to show you very quickly four of them that are very close to my heart. You have people or groups of people tackling how it should be in pubs, in learning, in dementia care, and even reinventing carrier bags because they're not satisfied with how it is and they think people deserve better and they want to change the world. I see these people as creating beacons of light. They're building lighthouses. pa -ching. Why? They're building their vision. They're building their vision of how it should be, and they're spreading the word. They're spreading the message out there far and wide. So they're building their lighthouses, and they're switching on that beam. And um, what they find is when they switch on the beam, they attract people who care. They flock to them. People come, people who care, people who believe in what they're doing, people who want to give their time and their money and their skills and their resources to help these people make change. And that's exactly what Amy and I did. So... Hisby all started with a blog. I say that now and it sounds nuts. Hisby all started with a blog. We didn't know what we were doing. We just needed, knew that we needed help. We started a blog online and we used it to connect with people who cared about and who were into food issues nationally and locally. And we used it to create a networking system on and offline to inform what we were doing. And that blog became the voice of Hisby. And it started as a very small voice, and built into a rallying cry for a better food system.
and it attracted people from all over the country and locally, people who wanted to help, people who gave us their time, people who trusted us with their money, people who gave us a few kind words, which was all that we needed. So we slowly built the brand, built on people who just wanted to see a different kind of supermarket. And these people, thousands of people, drew us up onto their shoulders and made us taller and helped us reach our goal of opening this store. And some people ask me, some people say, well, can one store change the food industry? And I think it can, because I think that if it challenges the assumptions and perceptions that people have about the status quo, then it can. It's an example of what can be done. And here we are, standing here with these thousands of people, saying, you can have change, and you can, you can recreate the norm. We're living proof that it doesn't have to be that way. Just as a lot of the news uh, coming out about big supermarkets at the moment is proof that stuff definitely needs to change. You see, our model is working. Hisby, after 10 months of being open, is 11% ahead of the sales target that we set last year. We're serving 2,400 people a week. We're breaking even, uh, exceeding even our expectations. And we give 68p of every penny in the pound to our suppliers, which we think is healthy for a sustainable food industry. And we've got now an amazingly dedicated, friendly team of people who together with me, Amy, and Jack, the other director, are running the store. And so we invite you to use Hisby as a symbol of change, as an example of what can be done to show that conventions can be broken and you can challenge how it is. To budding innovators here today, we say, build your lighthouse and chuck on that beam. It doesn't have to be look like this. It can look like this. <laughs> start small. But the important thing is that you start. You get your vision up there, and you get the word out, and people will come to help you. <laughs> to people who want to see change, we say, you are the change makers. Look out for these beams. Look out for these lighthouses. Follow the beams and help the people create the change. Because in the end, that's what it took two sisters to do, to challenge the food industry and to challenge supermarkets. It took us a sense of indignation, a very clear vision of how it should be, and a lighthouse on full beam for everyone to see. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs>